Look, um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special event put on by uh, Hornsbury Library. Uh, tonight, I'll be speaking with uh, distinguished historian uh, Mark McKenna about his uh, fantastic recent book, Return to Uluru. We've got a wonderful crowd here uh, at the Story Community Centre. I think we've got about 25, 30 people in person, and at least that many also uh, joining us via Zoom this evening. So my name is Michael Bennett. I'm a locally based historian who works with Aboriginal communities around New South Wales in, in native title and, and other heritage projects. And certainly I would like uh, on behalf of uh, Hornsby Library and Hornsby Council to recognize the traditional owners of the, the lands of Hornsby where we meet tonight, the, the Darug and the Garingai peoples. I pay respects to their elders and ancestors past and present and to their enduring heritage and connection to country. Uh, I'd also like to welcome all Aboriginal people who are present here this evening. We acknowledge and uphold their intrinsic connections and continuing relationships to, uh, to country. So, uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us here uh, virtually uh, this evening. We've got uh, an avid crowd in person and online ready to, uh, yeah. to, to, to listen to you. Uh, your book, A Return to Uluru, uh, recently recently published. It captures uh, a, a phenomenal story, a story that's not that well known uh, about the dramatic killing of uh, Ananu, uh, Aboriginal fellow called Yopanana by a policeman, Bill McKinnon, at Uluru in, in 1934. I wanted to start by asking if you could sort of briefly retell that story and, and how you came to, to come across that, come across that story. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, hello, everyone in the audience, and hello, everyone out in the uh, the Zoom the Zoomosphere or wherever it's called, whatever, whatever we might call it. Thanks for thanks for coming along tonight to to hear about my book. So, um, yeah, where to start? Well, I guess I, I I started Michael with the idea that I'd be writing a originally writing a book about the whole idea of the centre in Australia's imagination. Um, I'd always known about this shooting um, because there was a board, a Commonwealth Board of Inquiry into the shooting one year or six months after it happened in 1935, there was a Commonwealth Board of Inquiry. But I guess um, what happened with this book was that the more and more I found out about the shooting itself, and the more I dug around the story of this man's life, this policeman's life, yeah, and the man he'd killed inside, literally inside Uluru in a cave, the, the more that this shooting, this one event took over my whole, took over the book, if you like, hijacked it, I guess, um, because I started to realise that I could actually wrap a lot of the original ideas I had about exploring what the centre means to Australians around this event. And I, I guess um, what I, what's, what's happened in a way in the book is that all, it starts with a European quest for the centre, but it actually that quest is overtaken completely um, by the Indigenous perspective of Uluru and the consequences of this event in 1934, which, you know, it's much more for the Ananu at Uluru. It's not just one event or one shooting. It had a really fundamental importance for them uh, in, you know, and, and their whole um, relationship to the rock after Europeans, are certainly in the 20th century. So um, I guess what I've tried to do in the book is to take this one moment, this one moment in a policeman's life and Yokonana, who of course was killed, and to track the two histories of that moment, their, their afterlives, I guess, you know, to track their after, the afterlives of this moment in Aboriginal history and in European history, and try and try and get them to talk to one another because often these two histories travel, as I say, on parallel tracks. They don't actually talk to one another. So I've tried to do that in the book. Um, 
And along the way, of course, I found out a lot of uh, quite incredible things about that we've never known before about the shooting. And I had the feeling writing this book a lot of the time that I was, um, I was just a kind of, it had its own, as if this story had its own rhyme and reason. And I was just following my nose and doing the job of writing it down. Um, as I've never really felt like that with a book before, but I did with this one. With, with Bill McKinnon, it's um, at the same time sort of fascinating and, and disturbing that the role that, that he took uh, and the fact that, uh, that he'd li lived a life before moving to the centre. In other parts of Australia, he'd been to, to New Guinea as well and worked yeah. in, in uh, law enforcement and, and corrections. Uh, and there's that sense, I don't know, sometimes that, at least from the New South Wales perspective, that the frontier finished in the 1800s, yeah. which may be the case in New South Wales, but for other parts of Australia, it's it's much more recent. It's almost into the the living living present. I was yeah. wondering if you could talk a little bit, a, a little sure, bit about sure. the enduring yeah. frontier in Australia. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's true, what you've just said, that the characterization of the frontier is often as if it's kind of something that happened way back in the colonial past. Um, and even with a film like High Ground, I don't know how many people in the audience have seen that film, recent film, High Ground. If you haven't, I'd recommend seeing it. You know, I've read reviews of that film, uh, which say that, oh, it's so good to see Australia's um, frontier in, the, in colonial times, colonial frontier, the adjective colonial. Right. But the story I'm writing about is a frontier that is post federation, that is actually at the same time Don Bradman is, is scoring runs, these killings and massacres are still taking place in central and northern Australia. So I think we have to really um, reconfigure our whole conception of what the frontier means. It's not something that's distant. In fact, what this book shows is that you can find the legacies of Australia's frontier in a suburban garage today, yes. which is yeah. what happened to me. Yeah. So well, look, as, as an historian myself, um, the, the process that you went through in finding information is, is, is quite extraordinary. I guess partly serendipitous, but at the same time, you, you followed through to, to locate a, a, an archive which for a lot of perhaps similar events doesn't exist. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, that process of, of, of finding, I guess, even McKinnon's personal uh, reflections about his, his own actions in the centre. Yeah, of sure. I mean, um, so I should explain to the audience that um, there's quite a lot of um, documentary evidence around this shooting that's in uh, the, the National Archives, Northern Territory Archives, um, Commonwealth Board of Inquiry, there's, you know, plenty of documents around that. But once I was on a biographical hunt, as much as anything, I started to dig in unusual places. And just by sheer chance, I was Googling one night and I found a work of Albert Namajira's that was that had been donated to the Queensland Art Gallery in 2004, I think. And it was a work of Namajira, one of his first works, which had been commissioned by the policeman, Bill McKinnon, uh, who asked Namajira to engrave his camel patrol, his police camel patrol, on a piece of mulga wood. And, and that's what Namajira did. And McKinnon paid him for it. His daughter donated that to the Queensland Art Gallery many years later and left her married name. Yeah, on that. And so then I just went to the white pages. I rang up every person of that surname with the initial S in Australia. And eventually I found her, fortunately, living in Brisbane. And I was so lucky that she immediately said, she was 82, early 80s, she, she immediately said, look, I've got some things of dad's. They're in my garage. Would you like to come up and have a look at them? Well, I couldn't believe my luck. So, you know, I had no idea what I'd find. It could have been, there could have been very little there. But in fact, 
it was like a kind of, uh, it's a bit like a fairy tale in a way, you know, in old trunks, in a garage. Yes, there was every archive, every journal, right, that this man had ever kept, including the one that he kept on the morning after the shooting occurred in 1934, which, as I opened it, I realised that whereas he had told all the while, he'd told the Commonwealth Board of Inquiry and for many, many other people for many years that he just fired into the cave without taking aim at Yokonana. There, in his own words now, were I fired to hit. So I knew I had the evidence that he'd, he'd always been lying to the, to the Board of Inquiry and to to journalists and many other people for, for, for years afterwards. And, but I also found, you know, all of his photographs of Central Australia, some of which are in the book. Um, he was someone who was caught up in the whole idea of the centre and its romance. He patrolled an area of 25,000 square kilometres the so-called Southwest Camel Patrol in the early 30s with his Aboriginal trackers. And he was, you know, police, it's important for people, for everyone to realise, I think, that police had a range of different tasks in the early 30s in Central Australia. They took the census of Aboriginal people. Uh, they distributed rations. They arrested people for petty crimes or major crimes. Uh, they were really the sole arbiters of all cross-cultural conflict, uh, you know, or no, contact, I should say, so cross-cultural contact. And, you know, I think for us today, it's important also to see that for the Ananu, for Aboriginal people everywhere, really, they watched as fences were erected on their lands. And suddenly, as Sammy Wilson, one of the senior custodians of Uluru today says, you know, said to me, once those fences went up, the white fella just assumed that the land was theirs for the taking. Yes. And police were then placed in the position, yeah, of enforcing that law, of actually doing the job of enforcing a law that had just been imposed from above without any negotiation, of course, it was just imposed. And so there's a whole structure of law and an assumption that the land was there for the taking, which police were meant to enforce. And Bill McKinnon was one of those who was charged with that job. And he did it ruthlessly and efficiently. Mark, I'm uh, fascinated by the relationship between uh, McKinnon, I guess the police generally, and, and trackers that mm. they relied on. McKinnon. Yeah was new to the centre in the 18, in the 1930s and obviously didn't necessarily know how to move across that landscape. He relied on those trackers very much. But then the trackers also played a seminal role, as, as you set out in the book, about mm. doing it and, and capturing um, Aboriginal, supposed Aboriginal offenders. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about those sort of cross-cultural complexities uh, and, the, and the role of the... Of the yeah, the that's, a, that's a good question, Michael, because, you know, like so often with that word frontier, we think of it as having two sides, but it's a, it's a much more murky place. It's a much more complex place than that. So there are many, many sides to this frontier. As with every colonial encounter, it's, it's never simply uh, white on black. Um, you know, it's, it's in this case, you, you have Aboriginal people who for various reasons are attracted to working with the white police um, sometimes because it gave them power over other Aboriginal people. It gave them access to certain benefits from working with, with uh, the police. Um, and often some of those Aboriginal trackers were responsible for some of the, the, the worst violence. Um, I mean, for example, Police Paddy, who was Bill McKinnon's tracker, one of his two main trackers, had been involved in the Coniston massacre in 1928 and, and had been responsible for, for some of the killing in that massacre. And he had a fearsome reputation. Um, and so 
Oh, I've just disappeared into the darkness. Don't worry, everyone. I'll come back. This is just Mark's office. He needs to, uh, to, to I think his lights are movement sensitive, so he'll be back yeah, with us very, back very shortly. Here we go. Yes, I've just been sent into eternal darkness, but I've returned. Sorry about that. Um, I'm back. So, um, yes, uh, the policing angle, the policing um, part of this history is really, really crucial, of course, to... Um, to understanding how it was possible that such a thing could happen, yeah? I mean, this book is going to be published in America in early 2022, and you might be interested to know that I was talking to the editor in New York, the, the Penguin editor, and, and he said to me, or I said to him, I said, oh, is it because, you know, Uluru is an internationally recognised tourist destination? Is that why you, you want to... Uh, published this in the States. And he said, no, no, no. He said, no, most Americans wouldn't know where Uluru was. Well, apologies to any Americans out there who obviously do. But uh, no, it was the Black Lives Matter policing aspect of this story, the kind of resonances into that politics today, which actually, <laughs> interestingly, that, that unfolded as I was writing. It, it, I mean, it wasn't, hap it wasn't happening, that politics, in, this, yeah, in the way it is now when I started. So, um, you know, and when we look at the policing um, controversies that we've seen in just in the last few months, you know, the ongoing problems with white policemen and Aboriginal incarceration and deaths in custody, you know, I think around 470 since that report was handed down in 1993. This history of policing in Central Australia in the early 30s really does, you know, show the background, some of the background to where we've come from today. Look, I mean, I, from even in New South Wales and some of the Aboriginal communities I would work with, that they still firmly believe that the, the police blindness is, is still there in a sense that some of those attitudes have not, have not changed. No, the, I mean, I think in part, it, like in the 1930s, the European population in Central Australia were extremely they felt vulnerable because they were outnumbered by five, five to one. And, mm -hmm. and so that often resulted in a very aggressive response to any violation of what they saw as their security. Um, and that's, that, that also uh, occurred in policing in the way that police actually carried out their job, you know? So, um, yeah. Mark, you also talk about the, some of the Anunu versions of, of the story, that they have, they have kept telling the story about the, the murder. Of they the have, yeah. In various ways. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to give a sense of uh, how, how important that story is to the traditional owners of Uluru and, and, sure, and sure. why they, they have, have kept that close to, to, the, to their heart and to, and to, their, to their culture. Yeah, that's that's very important. Um, firstly, I guess um, you know because Yokonana was one of six men who escaped, um, and McKinnon had chased towards Uluru. Like just a bit of background. So McKinnon had been sent out to arrest the killers of an Aboriginal man who had been actually killed under tribal law. Um, and because a rifle was used to kill that man, that, in, that meant whitefella law was introduced because Aboriginal people weren't allowed to possess firearms. So he went out, he arrested six people. I'm giving you the really short story here. And under, you know, used coercion, all kinds of coercion and, and violence to extract confessions, arrested six people. Um, they escaped, uh, ran towards Uluru. He rearrested two men, four of them, he, caught, he chased to Uluru, he shot Yokonana in a cave, but three other men escaped. Um, and one of those men was Paddy Uluru, who is, you know, was one of the senior custodians of Uluru and is the grandfather of Sammy Wilson, who is now one of the senior custodians of Uluru. And one of the other men who escaped was Joseph Donald. And if anyone in the audience wants to watch what I think is one of the most 
incredible pieces of eyewitness Indigenous testimony that you can get at the click of a button anyway. Just Google Joseph Donald Uluru and you'll see one of the four men who McKinnon chased to the rock in 34 and who escaped giving his eyewitness account of, of this event. It's extraordinary. Joseph Donald Uluru. Now, so because Paddy Uluru, Joseph Donald, all these other men who escaped, they, they left Uluru shortly. They, you know, they didn't return to Uluru after this shooting, understandably, uh, with violence like that. And in fact, they didn't return for another 20 years or so until tourism starts to take off at Uluru in the 50s. Um, and for Paddy Uluru and many other Ananu, this, moment, this event, this shooting, was a fundamental uh, illustration of the way they'd been pushed out of their country and the terror that the police often employed to, after all, here we see uh, an Aboriginal man who's killed and he's defenceless. You know, he, he, he had threw, throws a stone, that's, that's, uh, but, but he's shot um, without and had no recourse to arms to defend himself. So Aboriginal people at Uluru had seen this as a foundational historical moment. And when Uluru was handed back in 1985 to the Anunu by the Hawke government, this, this killing was fundamental to the case that they, their legal case for that handbag. So it's remained important all the way through. Also because, you know, Bill McKinnon was also responsible like every other policeman at the time for taking Aboriginal people or kids away from their families. Um, and so he was known for a whole raft of reasons, uh, remembered. And um, one of the incredible things was that when I found his archive in Brisbane in the garage, and, you know, he continued to keep a log of his life, every day of his life, even after he finished as a retired. He won the New South Wales Lottery, I think, in 1961, retired, and then went to Budrum in Queensland. Um, but he logged every day of his life uh, until he died in, in his 90s, in 1997. Um, and he went back to Uluru as a tourist in his 80s. Uh, climbs the rock, stays at Yulara Tourist Resort. So his life embodies, in 50, his, that 50-year period, em, embodies the change, um, the change in our whole conception of Uluru from being a rock to being the centre, you know, the spiritual centre of the nation, and, and his life embodies that change. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> yes. Um it's, it's very interesting. You, you mentioned that uh, the, the, the rock being returned to, to Anunu people in, yeah. in, in 1985. And I guess there's been a gradual process of, of them reasserting their cultural authority over the rock. Of course, the, the climb closed several, several years ago. Yeah. Um, there are so many layers to the story. The, the place where the, the shooting took place is uh, a, a a very spiritual place, yeah. very important stories mm -hmm. associated with that. Um, and But at the same time, under, from what you've said in the book, the Anunu people do not, in, in the interpretive panels, do not actually talk about the story. They've decided to, to no. focus on, I guess, their own connection to Uluru. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's, it, I was really um, fascinated to see that. You know, when you go to Uluru, to Mutajulu, and you go to Mutajulu Waterhole, where this... Uh, the shooting happened very close to that waterhole. Um, there's no mention of it there. And I can kind of understand why, because um, all of the interpretive panels around Uluru are around, the, they're, they're about the culture, the cultural significance, if you like, of various spots around the rock. And, the dream, and you know, Jukapa, the law, the dreaming stories. Um, so this... You know, this event is a desecration. It's another desecration of the rock, um, of a sacred place. In the same way that when tourism started at Uluru in the 50s, um, some of the paintings on the cave walls that um, 
people had noticed in the 1930s and written about were, you know, graffitied uh, people have, you know, used soap or, or detergent in the waterhole and fouled the waterhole. Uh, not now, but, uh, but this happened, uh, you know, for, for a couple of decades. So um, when Paddy Uluru and, other, and his family came back to Uluru in the 50s, they were shocked at the desecration of their site and of, of this site. And, and I suppose, you know, the, one of the interesting questions now is that, and we should get to the issue of human remains, um, is whether this story will now be told at Uluru in some way, whether it will be mentioned. We'll, we'll see, we'll soon see, yes. Mark, you mentioned um, the, 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 the um, important issue of ancestral remains, of course, a, a massive issue for Aboriginal communities across Australia with a phenomenal number of sets of remains that were, have, have over the last 200 years been excavated and, and removed, mm -hmm. not only to institutions in Australia, but throughout the world. There's a, a strong push now to see those remains returned. Yeah. And in this particular case, Yokonana's remains were... were removed to uh, an institution, institution yeah. down in mm. South Australia. And yeah. I understand that there's sort of a, a process now to, to see those remains return to their rightful place. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, this history of the taking of human remains is uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries is, is uh, you know, is one of the most um, unsettling and disturbing, horrific aspects of Australia's frontier history, taken often in the names of so-called scientific research, and sometimes often just uh, for, you know, just just for collecting. Um, many of uh, like places like the South Australian Museum have many Aboriginal remains that they just can't return to country because they don't they don't know the provenance of these remains. Um, I discovered that those, that Yokonana's remains were there in the South Australian Museum because uh, uh, of two, for two reasons. Um, a friend of mine who's a historian, James Warden, had, had asked the South Australian Museum many years ago whether they were there and never got a reply, but why, I'm not sure. Um, and he reminded me to, to ask them again. Uh, and second, because I found a reference by Bill McKinnon in his uh, garage, in his archive, which said, oh, in a cavalier fashion, the remains of that man are in the basement of the University of Adelaide uh, where they belong. Now, why were they there? Because the Commonwealth Board of Inquiry in 1935, which investigated the shooting, and found that Bill McKinnon had, Bill McKinnon's shooting of Yokonana was, quote, legally justified, but unwarranted, right? The members of that board, the head of that board of inquiry was John Cleland. He was a professor of pathology at University of Adelaide. He took Yokonana's remains back with him uh, as head of the inquiry back to the University of Adelaide. And that's how they came to be there. Um, so I sent an email, oh, and then I didn't hear back. Um, and unexpectedly, when I was visiting the McKinnon family in Brisbane, while I was in sitting in the dining room of, of uh, his daughter's home, I had a call from the South Australian Museum to tell me that Yokonona's remains, uh, his skull, in fact, with his name etched on it, was in the, in the South Australian Museum because they'd moved all the remains that the University of Adelaide had to the South Australian Museum sometime in the uh, seven or eight years ago. So that was a kind of, that was an incredible moment because of course it opened up another whole other dimension, uh, the taking of, of Aboriginal remains. The, and it also of course meant that there was now you know, there was now a capacity, a potential for Yokonana's remains to be brought home, to be repatriated. And I hope that sometime this year that will 
that will take place. Um, so that, the, as well as, you know, the discovery in the garage, um, all of the, the archival information I found there, um, there was uh, this, the, there's now the question of the remains and I've still got, and that their repatriation and, and the story's still unfolding, you know, it's not yet complete because for both families, for the Ananu fam, family, the relatives of Yokonana, and also for the descendants of Bill McKinnon, this, this event is not yet resolved somehow. It's still, it's still to be resolved, if it, if it ever can be. Completely. Mark, it's, it's, it's clear from the book how um, closely you've worked with uh, the Ananu community over the last couple of years, um, just recording their perspective, but then also reporting back what you've found, the incredible discoveries you've made in terms of yeah. uh, archival research and, and, and the remains of the museum. I was wondering if you'd like to reflect a little bit about uh, how you've gone about working with, com with communities as a, I guess, as a, and this is an interest from my point of view as a non-Aboriginal historian working with Aboriginal yeah. communities, how, what approach have you, have you taken in respect to the story that you've told? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, initially, so initially um, my big problem was COVID. Um, so I had I had discovered all of these a lot of these things and and um, I couldn't go to Uluru to tell the family in person because it wasn't possible. Um, so my first discussion with Sammy Wilson and his and Reggie and Cassidy Uluru was um, on Zoom uh, and um, yeah, so that was a that that was quite. Uh, a strange moment, but a reassuring one, um, because it, you can imagine having to tell any family that uh, their ancestors' remains are in a museum, in a box, essentially. Um, it, you know, I had, how do you go into something like that? How do you communicate that to someone? And you know, I was immediately sort of... Um, relieved by their own generosity. You know, the first thing they said to me was, oh, thanks for finding this out. Thanks for letting us know. Um, and from that moment on, I was in close consultation with Sammy and uh, his partner, Kathy Tozer, who was very, very helpful. Um, and so, uh, you know, I went back to Uluru just after, well, the first the first time I could actually get, get into the Northern Territory, I, I got to Uluru in August 2020 um, and was able to meet them on site um, at the waterhole um, where this happened. And that was another incredible moment, which I write about in the book, because um, I had my phone, of course, you know, when have we not got our phones with us these days? Well, I had my phone with me and um, on the phone was a photograph that, um, had been taken in, in the Board of Inquiry in 1935 and it showed Bill McKinnon, um, who was with the Board of Inquiry, mind you. Bill McKinnon went with the Board of Inquiry in 35, showing them, you know, where the evidence was and cooking their food every day, as it turned out. Um, so, um, you know, on my phone, I had this photo of, of McKinnon leaning into the cave, showing the, the Board of Inquiry where he'd shot Yokonana. And I showed it to Sammy Wilson that day at Uluru in August 20 last year. And he just immediately looked at it and said, wow, let's go and find it. And so he just took off up the rock, you know, like it's, the, it's about 40 feet up from ground level where the shooting happened. And there we were with digital technology, you know, working with traditional knowledge and, um, after probably half an hour, he found the spot. He identified it. It had changed somewhat, but he found it. And that to be there up the rock at the time that he found that spot and to see how, how you know, moved he was to have found the spot where, where his, uh, his grand uncle had died 
was really an unbelievable moment and uh, another one. You know, I, I don't think I'm going to come across a story, a story quite like this again. I mean, how could how could you? It, it's kind of it just kept unfolding and it's continuing to unfold and it, it has a kind of it's it's somehow more complete potentially than any other story I've ever as any other history I've ever written, I think. Um, and it's it's not over yet. So no. An another layer to, to your story, of course, relates back to more recent political developments within Australia, the, the yeah. Uluru Statement from the Heart, uh, of course, recommending that there be a constitutional body advising parliament, but that's only mm. one strand of, of the recommendations. Mm. Uh, an an another strand is the importance of, of, of truth-telling. Truth-telling, yeah. And uh, I know that there's a, a wonderful quote from, from Megan Davis, who was instrumental in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, yeah. about the importance of, of your work as, as an example of truth-telling. I was wondering if you'd like to reflect a little bit about on the importance of bringing these stories to light and, and what impact they might have, uh, what impact you might hope that they might have on, on yeah. broader Australia and, and political developments as they unfold. Mm. No, that's, uh, that's, of course, it's a really uh, important question. And it's, so in the book... Um, it was tempting at times to, you know, the metaphorical dimensions of this event are, of course, fairly obvious, but also enormous. You know, this this happened all around Australia, this kind of thing. But but to to discover that or to realise that the place, the very place we've created as the spiritual centre of the country is, in fact, also, not only touch, but at its centre, at its heart, is an event of foundational brutality and violence that is so typical everywhere else around the country. You know, the fact that he was shot inside the rock, literally inside it, the, and, and how... I had to pull myself back not to overinterpret it, just to look, just to tell it, you know, because I wanted the reader to find their way into it. Um, but for truth telling, for truth telling, I think it's got enormous potential because of the significance of the place in our in our imagination, and it unsettles the kind of romantic spiritual center because it it shows you know the kind of brutality that's inseparable from any place so many places and histories in Australia um, but also the Uluru statement itself yeah another another incredible realization was that um, the Uluru statement you know sits on a piece of canvas it's 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 uh, surrounded by a beautiful painting that has, tells a story, a couple of stories of uh, dreaming stories from Uluru, key creation stories. Um, and one of those two places, one of those two dreaming you know, stories comes is about, is about Mutajulu Waterhole and the battle between the pythons and the brown snakes and Kunia and Liru. And then, of course, I realised that, you know, the Uluru Statement is itself surrounded by a painting that tells, visually tells, relates to the very same place where this shooting happened. So that, you know, truth-telling is part of the statement's DNA. It's, it's wrapped around it, literally. Um, and that was quite a, yeah, that was quite a startling... Uh, realization and and also that I think um, with the Uluru statement from the heart, Uluru becomes more than just a sacred place. It becomes a sacred text as well, sacred text and a sacred place. Um, and we we hear constantly the need to share our history. Um, which of course is, is very important to listen 
to those different histories. But we also have to now share power. We have to, the state, which is after all us, we have to cede ground. We have to listen to what the Uluru Statement has asked of us. And we have to enshrine that voice in the constitution and spell it out in a positive way. That has to be done. It will be done, I think. It will be achieved. Uh, but, you know, like all of these things, and I, I can elaborate, but it'll be a bit like all of these things, it's going to take quite some time to, to get the politicians to catch up to where I think the people are at the moment, which is a broad level of support for that idea. Mark, look, congratulations on the book. I think it's uh, it's it's an ex extraordinary achievement. Um, I've just had it in, in my mind for the last couple of weeks reading through it. Uh, it's, it's it's really quite eye opening and, and beautifully written. So congratulations. Um, I would Thanks, like, now like to um, uh, open up uh, the uh, the discussion to to some questions, both from uh, our, our friends online and and people here as well. Uh, those who are zooming in, uh, please feel free to use the chat function just to uh, just to type in your questions. So I've got access to those questions, so I can read them out to Mark. But uh, perhaps first, I might ask anybody in the in the audience if uh, if they have a question for Mark, um, and then um, I might have to relay it. But uh, we'll be able to uh, be able to pass that question on. I was just wondering what McKinnon's mother thought when she found out, you know, what was actually happening. Mark, could you hear that? It's, no, I uh, couldn't, sorry. It's, it's a question about um, Bill McKinnon's mother and how she reacted once she found yeah. out uh, uh, the, the story about 1934. Uh, well, um, as I explain in the book... Um, yeah, his when, daughter, sorry, yes. His daughter. When I yeah. first spoke to her on the phone, she um, told me that she had um, just been diagnosed with early-onset dementia. So uh, that is a factor, I think, in explaining her. She did, you know, she wasn't aware of any of this, but then she wasn't. That's not, I don't think it's fair to to say just how aware she was or wasn't. Um, she was very generous from the outset, and her family were very generous in letting me use the materials. And I've been in constant discussion since the book came out and before. With, um, with her children, um, McKinnon's grandchildren, effectively, especially one of them, uh, the youngest son, Matt, Matt Gollidge. Um, and only two weeks, three weeks ago, I was up in Brisbane talking to the family about the book because they'd read it now. Um, so that was, uh, that was, I can't talk about all of the, you know, everything that I discuss with them, of course, for privacy reasons, but um, it's because they didn't know about this, because they weren't aware of, it, of, of the whole, you know, the con they were aware that their grandfather was a policeman in Central Australia. But beyond that, after all, you know, they were, they were only young children when he was their grand, when, you know, when he died. Um, so, and like all, like all of us uh, with our grandparents, we only know the most sort of elemental general things often, unless, unless we, we live with them or grow up with them. Um, so it's been, it's been a difficult process, but at every step they've been very understanding and they're at the moment willing to, I mean, I should, should have explained that um, Sammy Wilson and his family have invited them to the repatriation ceremony whenever that takes place and they're willing to go. Uh, so that's a great, that's, yeah, at the moment, the potential for that to happen is real. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Mark, sorry, I'm going to bring you a question up. Uh, it's actually sort of blocking your face out on the screen, but I'll just that's have right. to read out a question. Uh, probably a good thing, uh, yes, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question coming in online uh, about uh, someone would like to know more about McKinnon's journals and yeah, whether, yeah. You're able to, uh, whether McKinnon's ideas about Aboriginal issues changed over time uh, and why, 
why do you think McKinnon left his journals, despite the fact that it's, in a sense, it's made his culpability yeah. for the act much more clear? Good questions. Um, okay, so I'll the second I'll deal with the the question of why he left them second, and I'll start with the question of uh, what they're like or, what, or whether his views changed. I mean, oh, I've just gone into darkness again. Hang on, I'll, I can stay in darkness, but hang on, I just go. On. Oh, I think we we need you in the light, Mark. We need you in the light. So. This is the problem when you don't have a light switch in your office. You've only got some someone up there who's controlling the damn thing. Anyway, so um, back again. Uh, yeah, his views didn't change uh, very much at all. So, for example, in his journal, he writes about going back to Uluru in the 80s. He climbed the, in his 80s, in the 1980s both, and he climbed the rock again and he went to a kind of reunion, pioneers reunion dinner at, um, at the Rock. Uh, and he said in that journal that people told him that they were about to, quote, hand the place back to the blacks, unquote. And they also told him that some of them would rather burn the place down than do that. And he, he wrote something to the effect of, well, I, I wouldn't say anything if they did, you know. So, so I mean, he was, he was, not, he was not someone who um, who took, you know, who was willing to walk back from what he did. He defended his actions till the end of his life. He presented himself as someone who was upholding the law. Um, and... I don't think his position, at least on the Indigenous question, changed very much at all, um, despite the fact that everything was changing around him, yeah, um, in so many ways. As for the question, and so the journals are quite extensive, but they're also very mundane in the sense that, you know, he logs every, every trip to Woolworths and every mowing of the lawn and every, you know. So you get the full, you get every detail. And it, it kind of is moving after a while. It does have a, a moving effect. It's a bit like Ulysses, as I say in the book. But, um, yeah, he, you know, why did he keep them? I suppose because, I, I, look, I've asked myself that question so many times, you know, why would you keep journals, especially one of which basically incriminated you in your own handwriting? I think that as a historian in my time, you know, in a lot of my work, I've seen how so many people who I've written about have an eye for historical, for posterity, yeah? I think McKinnon wanted to be written about and he had been written about by Australian writers like Frank Clune, even while he was alive. And I think he kept them... Maybe he'd forgotten what he wrote in that journal in 1934. Maybe, maybe he'd come to believe his own fictions. I don't know. Uh, I've often wished that I could ask him why he kept them. Um, but what he didn't do, he didn't send those journals to the, to the Northern Territory archives, whereas he did send other things, like his, some of his photographs, right? Um, and other records. So, so he was selective about what he sent to, to the archives, but he kept those things at home in the garage. So I'm just extremely fortunate that I, I had access to that archive. Extreme. I think we might have some other questions from, uh, from the, the audience. There was a, a lady up the back, I think, who was... Oh, I see. Mark, we have a question from the audience about whether the, the killing of Yokonana was uh, perhaps uh, Bill McKinnon's only 
act of violence? Uh, would it, are there any other acts, similar acts that he participated in? Any other indiscretions as well? In, I mean, yes, in, in some of the journals uh, that describe in his own handwriting some of the methods that he used and his trackers used to, to uh, arrest pe Aboriginal people, yes, there, there are other acts of violence, um, not, shoot, not, you know, recordings of, of shootings, like as with the Okanana, but, but certainly of bashing and, and other extreme methods of, of uh, extracting information um he was charged again with um beating an aboriginal man in darwin in the early 1940s but he was um, found not guilty of that charge um and he had a fierce reputation a reputation for being fierce if you like um but I think that it's also true to say that because of the Board of Inquiry in 1935 and because of the obvious, the, the police were aware of, and not only the police, you know, pastoralists, settlers were aware of the Commonwealth government's sensitivity and intention to stop the kinds of mistreatment and violence that like the Coniston massacre and other severe examples of that, but also to, you know, to show that they would not, they that Australia would not be embarrassed internationally by news of 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 further um, violence. So the police were aware of that sensitivity, and I think that there was a kind of they they watched very carefully how they what they what they wrote down, and and I think. There's no, there's no question that the violence uh, continued well into the 1940s in different ways. I mean, but it continued. The frontier, there was no one moment when the frontier just comes to a stop. You know, it just changes in its manifestations. And it's, it's even ongoing today because Aboriginal people are still grappling in, you know, with the basic problem of having laws and policies forced upon them, having to accommodate those laws and policies, adapt their own lives, yet they don't feel they have sufficient say that they're not negotiated with, they're not consulted sufficiently in the, in the making of those laws, which is what the Uluru Statement's all about, after all. Mike, I think we've got time at least for, for one more question. Um, and we've got another one coming in from uh, on, online. And what has been the reaction of the Anunu people to the publication of the story? I know you uh, mentioned yeah. that a little bit before, but to elaborate um, on that. I mean, I'd, I'm about to find out in person because I'm going to go up to um, Uluru in August. Um, there's a writers' festival in Alice Springs in late August, and I'll be up there to talk about the book then. And I'll go out to Uluru to meet again with Sammy and, and the family, hopefully. Um, I have been in touch with them uh, since the book's publication. I sent them copies of the book. Um, and uh, Sammy Wilson very kindly recorded a, a five minute video. Um, in which he sort of stands on site at, at the Mujulu waterhole and um, urges people to read the book and to see it in the context of truth telling nationally. Um, so I feel very fortunate to have the support of the family. Very fortunate. Well, look, uh, thank you, Mark, so much for joining us this evening. And uh, I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but I was just going to ask everyone for a round of applause for your uh, wonderful book. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Michael. And, and um, yeah, thanks thanks to everyone out there for, for listening and coming along. Um, and, um, yeah, and for the opportunity to talk about the book. Appreciate it. Okay, I can't wonderful. sign it, but hey, you know, I, I would if I could. <laughs> well, we've got a wonderful local bookseller up the up the back, so I certainly encourage everyone to to get your own copy and 
to, to delve into this, uh, this, this fascinating story. So thank you once again, Mark. Yeah, pleasure, Michael. Thank you.